Okay, Bibles. Let me see those. Physical Bibles. Hold them high. Okay, good job. Um, electronic Bibles. Let me see those, please. Electronic Bibles. A little fewer. A little fewer. It's all right. Um, sometimes it helps to have the text illuminated with LED lights. And if that helps you, then, then so be it. Um, but I still like the sound of the pages. Hopefully Android comes out with it first, the sound of Bible pages as you're... <laughs> Hallelujah. I have... I have had this story on my heart for maybe a year or more. Um... And it just feels right now. At first blush, when I get into this, if you're not careful, you're going to look at it as though it's an evangelistic message to those that don't, ne don't yet know Jesus. But I have found in my own experience, especially dealing with, with other people, that this subject is misunderstood and underutilized in the lives of those that say they know him. So I kind of feel like I'm introducing cornflakes to a group that's eaten cornflakes their whole life. And uh, so I'm asking you to look at it with a intentional, fresh perspective, uh, and just ask the Lord for fresh insight. The scripture is referred to as the living word, quite frankly, because it's alive. And in much the same way that you and I, whenever we get together, typically will not have the same conversation. Why? Because we're alive and things are shifting and things are, are changing. How many of you ever read a passage of Scripture and you thought, wow, that hit me right between, that's just exactly what I needed for where I'm at. My goodness. And then a month rolls around and for whatever reason you catch that same passage and you go, wow, that hit, it hit me so different than what it did last month, but it's, it's so right on for right where I'm at again. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's going to be very difficult for you to open up the Word and read something that's not going to have some sort of real-life application to you right now because the Word is alive, and it's looking for a way to improve your life. Okay? Um, in much the same way, are you guys old enough to remember Fix a Flat? <laughs> he started laughing at me. I know the congregation's getting older and older because if I bring some up and you laugh at me, then I know. So, but when you put when you put that can of fix flat on there and it and it spits all that goo, what do you do? You 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 take off rolling. Why? Because you want it to spread so the fix it flat can find the hole. When we go through life, we get a lot of holes. And if the word is in us. It'll seal us up. If the word is not in us or there's not enough, it might leak out. You misunderstand it. Might leak out. You guys catch anything I'm saying? We have to learn to put it in. Why do we go to doctors so often? Because we ain't putting in our body what our body needs to run on. We're going to the filling station and we're putting gasoline in a diesel or diesel in a gasoline machine and then getting upset that it doesn't run right and then run to the mechanic and say, well, I don't know what the deal is. I went and filled up like I always did. Well, you're running on the wrong stuff. So when you're running on entertainment and highs and emotion and uh, whatever feels good and whether or not other people are there and all this stuff, then you're just running on flats. You're not making any real progress. You're just damaging your own self. Make sense? Wave at me if I'm making sense to anybody. Okay. So if you got your Bibles, which I know you do, please turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm 
I'm going to have to intentionally not look at Dr. Cranmer because he loves it when I talk about this subject. Would you grab me that box of tissue? Can I say this too? I love the fact that I can disagree and still live in harmony. I, I, just, I, just, I just do. Um, I said this during the men's thing, but it bears note now. You don't have to agree with everything the way that, that I believe it, nor I you. As long as our basics are there, virgin birth, Jesus is Lord, death, burial, resurrection, come on, release of the Holy Spirit, and he's coming again. If we're in agreement with all that, then, then everything else is extra. It's needful. It helps. But I can function in harmony with people that don't believe everything the way that I do. And that's necessary for all of us. Um, how many has ever sang harmony? I was listening. You know, I'm always look, looking for new music, too. And I found one, and I thought, wow, that, that guy's voice is pretty good. And so I started listening, and then a female voice piped in, and she took the lead, and he shifted from lead to harmony, but I'm still listening to his voice. Well, his voice alone singing harmony sounds like trash when it's not lead because the harmony part sounds weird. I ain't catching it yet. I think the way I minister is harmonious. There's a lot of people that are preaching lead. And if you listen to what I'm saying as a lead part, you'll miss the fact that it's meant to function together. <laughs> Y'all must be tired. The heat got to you. Come on, air conditioning. Go back there in the mighty name of Jesus. So here it is. I believe that the devil feels like grace is a dirty word. Now, if the Lord releases me, I'm going to talk about Christians cursing here so real soon. That's going to be an interesting message. Um, but a curse word for the devil is grace. You think about that. So grace is it's the power behind the gospel. There is no greater power of the gospel than salvation itself. However, salvation is individual. When Jesus told the, the apostles and the disciples, he said, go to Jerusalem and wait until you be endued with power, there is more to the gospel that's singing harmony that really does fill in a lot of holes in people's lives. Where salvation alone doesn't get it, the power of God functioning in healing, wholeness, wellness, life, peace, prosperity, joy, favor, protection, and deliverance, all of those things are necessary components that are still a part of the gospel, may not be the protein, but it's definitely your Brussels sprouts. Huh? So, it's the power behind the gospel. It's not creed. It's not religion. It's not philosophy. You're going to hear me say this hopefully several times throughout the message. Grace is God's reward at Christ's expense. Grace is God's reward at Christ's expense. And you're going to see this demonstrated in the story today of Mephibosheth. Any other Mephibosheths in the house? Second Samuel 9, verse 1. And David said, Is there anyone still left in the house or the family of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? This is so not in my notes. 
I know I'm going off the reservation and I haven't gotten hardly anywhere at all, but let me say it like this. Saul was a king of Israel. David now is the king of Israel. There would, uh, would not have been a throne for David had there not been a throne for Saul. Those of you that know the story know that Jonathan, son of Saul, was great friends with David. In fact, they made covenant. We're going to get into that. But I need you to hear this. There would not be a no excuses ministry if it had not been for other ministers and ministries in times past. We're really on their shoulders. Y'all catch anything so far? So while God may have vacated that process for today, I honor that process that was used then because if it wasn't used then, we wouldn't be candidates to be used now. The catch is we got to see what is God still using and use that. I can't use it because that's what God used to bring me here. I said that as much for me as it did for you because I may have to rewind this because there's another message there. But so it's on film. Okay, verse 2. There was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I'm your servant. And the king said, Is there no longer anyone left in the house of the family of Saul to whom I may show the goodness and graciousness of God? And Ziba replied to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan one whose feet are crippled. And so the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba replied to the king, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then King David sent word and had him brought from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell down on his face and lay himself down in respect. David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Here is your servant. And David said to him, Do not be afraid, for I will certainly show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul, and you shall always eat at my table. Again, Mephibosheth lay himself face down and said, What is your servant that you would be concerned for a dead dog like me? And then summoned the king Ziba, Saul's servant. And he said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and to all his house and family. So you and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons. <laughs> Can you imagine the Christmas list? <laughs> Fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do according to everything that my lord the king commands. And so Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he always ate at the king's table. And he was lame. In both feet. I don't know how well I'm going to stick to my notes today. So the story goes that Saul is king. God's done with Saul because Saul's been disobedient. But Saul's son Jonathan and David become best of buds and they make covenant together. Now, if you've ever been in marriage class with me, in counseling with me, sometimes even in deliverance with me, you have heard the story of David and Jonathan, how they went up the mountain and how they took an animal, split it down the middle, laid it open on the ground, walked in a figure eight with all the nastiness between the toes and all that kind of stuff, you know. They swapped clothes, they swapped weapons, they swapped, uh, they swapped credit cards, they swapped wallets, they swapped pictures, they, whatever they used to swap, they swapped, okay? And then they stood together in the midst 
of this dead animal, did the blood brother thing, sliced the wrist, commingled the blood, and they looked at each other and said, if I break this covenant, let it be to me as was done to this animal. Because they understood it's not a promise, it's a covenant. So, story progresses, read your Bible. David lives and Jonathan and Saul both die in battle. The custom of the day is that when there is a regime change, you kill the family of the predecessor so that none of them will grow up to want to take the throne back. Even in politics today, when, when, one, when one president vacates the White House and a new regime comes in, all the staff is fired. Why? Because they don't want to mix loyalties. I ain't hearing anything yet. So, so the nurse comes in because at this point Mephibosheth is five years old, scoops him up off the ground, takes off running trips, falls, and it does something. We don't know for certain exactly what happened except that he was lame in both legs. So I don't know if it was a spinal cord injury. I don't know if it was a leg injury. I don't know if it was an ankle, feet. I don't know. All I know is the Bible says he was lame. He was crippled. So now they're, they're just trying to get out of the palace because they're terrified that now David is going to come in and kill them, just take their heads off. So you have the offspring of Saul still alive. But David had made a covenant with Saul's son, Jonathan. And you're about to see just how David expressed and demonstrated grace into his life. Now, I'm going to skip some right now because I want to get, I want to make sure I have time for where I want to go. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, it says, It is because of the Lord's loving kindness that we are not consumed, because his tender compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great and beyond measure is your faithfulness. An old song is, great is thy faithfulness. Oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. One of the newer ones we played in, in recent history is you were faithful then, faithful now. Faithful you'll always be. So even today, we're still singing new songs about the faithfulness of God. The mindset of many is that you can work hard for your salvation. Even amongst those that said the prayer a minute from their heart, they still feel like if I do the work, then it makes me saved. When you're saved, it makes you work. <laughs> This is so simple, but yet it has eluded multitudes of people, okay? Working does not make you saved. But when you are truly saved, that salvation will cause you to get up and do what you would never have done otherwise. It will cause you to minister to people, to be available, to, to, to not punch a clock. You know what I'm saying? Well, if you're not going to call, you're available. Why? Because that salvation in you that reached and got you when you were a reprobate is now on the inside of you and you recognize every other reprobate that you know. And so now the love that got you is now using you to get them. Does that make sense? Let me just bring some definitions to grace because I think that's another misnomer. Do you guys know that there's different flavors of grace? If I said, how many of you like ice cream? Oh, yeah. Hold it high. Oh, what, what is it with you people? You didn't hear it the first time? Clean this ear out so you hear it out of this one. Okay, so when I said ice cream, how many of you were thinking of Rocky Road? 
How many is thinking of, of uh, what is that, butter brickle or whatever it's called? Neapolitan. Chocolate chip. Cookie dough. Birthday cake. I said ice cream, and though everybody was probably thinking of a different flavor, we all said yes to ice cream. Watch this. We all say yes to grace, but did you know that there's also many flavors of grace? How many knew that? How many did not know that? How many didn't vote? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, you're going to find that there is a thing that is called common grace. Common grace is the fact that God loves everyone. Okay? So there's a common grace that he gives all people whether they acknowledge him or not. So Matthew 5.45 says, He caused the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If, If God's grace was not involved, then rain would only show up at my house and your house and nobody else's house. If God's grace was not for all, then when the sun came up, only you and I would be able to see it, and everybody who didn't know him would live in literal darkness because there's no, gra- there's no common grace. So God allows the goodness of God and bad stuff that happens to happen to everybody. Why? It's a common grace. Even if you can't stand the thought of God, if you're an atheist, agnostic, Satanist, whatever, you can't stand the thought of Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit, any of that stuff, no, ma- no matter what your stance is, is, it is the common grace of God that allows you to draw breath that he gave. People that love him draw the breath of God. People that don't love him draw the breath of God. Common grace. Second type of grace is a saving grace. Anybody saved in the room? Uh, what in everybody's hands? We're going to be having an extra long service. To- I'm just kidding. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. See, this goes back to what I was saying a while ago. You cannot work to get salvation. That's why you have this person who's saved, who's doing the work of Jesus because of the gratefulness in their life, and you got this person who has no work of Jesus, but's trying to mimic the works that this person's doing in order, in order of the hopes that they might get the salvation that they got for free. So we have common grace, we have saving grace. Number three, there's a sanctifying grace. See, immediately after we're saved, God's grace goes to work to purify and to sanctify us. So we play a part in all that through obedience, okay? But ultimately, we have to count on his sanctifying grace. You find that in Philippians 1, verse 6. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. That is a, 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 an absolute work of grace of God in your life to help you to get rid of all the extra sludge in your life. I, would, I dare say deliverance is part of sanctification. Personal opinion. Number four, there's a provisional grace. What's that? That's the fact that God supplies all of our needs. James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. So when you get that better job, when you get an unexpected gift, count it as a gift from God. That's grace. It's provisional grace. Number five, one of my favorites, is miraculous and radical grace. (laughs) Miracles and deliverance. I'm telling you, we've been talking about miracles in the last week or so from from when our pastor friend from El Reno came in here, Sean McDaniel. How many of you got a touch in your body, got absolutely healed, mended, or restored? Look at that. We're going we're gonna to talk some more about those at another, another time. Acts 6, verse 8. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. It's a radical grace from God. Six, there's a serving grace. Every one of us has been given at least one spiritual gift. Many of us have multiple 
What's the point? To serve others and bolster their faith. You find that in 1 Peter 4.10. Each of you should use whatever gift that you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Look at there. He showed you grace has different flavors. And number seven, and I'm sure there's more, but I'm picking on seven. Seven says sustaining grace. How many have been going through some trying times and situations and circumstances? We, we need some sustaining grace. Second Corinthians 12 verse 9 says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. It's the grace of God that sustains us through mess. Last Sunday, I sat down. I hadn't done this in a minute with you guys during the prayer time. This, this is not uncommon for me. When I sit down and I pray for a little bit, and then I have a, a notebook handy, the Lord will start giving me stuff. And so on the 28th, I got one, two, three, four, a total of four pages. And I think sometimes in the moment, that's no big deal. That's no big deal. That's not a huge thought. And then I go back a couple days later, and I thought, whoa. <laughs> Did I write that? Man, look at that. And this is unpolished. This is just as I wrote it that day. But I said, Scripture is full of illustrations where what is happening in the life of an individual or a nation is a demonstration of what is happening spiritually. So you follow that? So look, here's, here's one just such instance in the story of David and Jonathan. We have people that work so hard to divide. They see you being happy, they want to throw a monkey wrench in it just because they can. Huh? How many's how many's ever come to you and say, well, listen, now, Frank, you gotta stop being friends with, you know, the so-and-so clan because so-and-so said such and such, and they did this, that, and the other. So you just gotta avoid the whole family. Huh? Yeah. I know y'all are so holy that you, you just don't let any of that even come into your little holy years. But I, I know that that kind of stuff happens where if you're upset at somebody, then you want to avoid the whole family as though it was their fault. It's not their fault. I really am a believer that history repeats itself. And I believe what we're seeing in Scripture, we can look at modern-day examples of how it's reoccurring even now in 2024. But David and Jonathan were absolutely different. They understood the meaning of covenant, brotherly bond. And so the condition of Israel back then is like the world is today. Corrupt leadership. Things are just tore up. Lots of turmoil. Saul had failed. He failed God. He failed the people. And now David is king. We know that Jonathan and Saul died on Mount Gilboa in 1 Samuel chapter 31. Then in 2 Samuel 4 verse 4, reiterating what I told you earlier, Mephibosheth is about five years old. And now, after falling, he's crippled. See, at that moment, I think that Mephibosheth's self-image necessarily changed. I know people that they get a, they get a scar on their face, and all of a sudden the world is just going to crater. Oh, my gosh. I forever am going to be advertising this cut on my – can you believe that? You got full-grown men in the bathroom using their wife's makeup trying to cover up a – Vanity, vanity. It's all vanity, right? And yet you have – Mephibosheth, who now literally cannot hold himself up and is at the, the grace of another. Guys, he can't get to the outhouse alone. Can't get to the table by himself. They didn't have these fancy 
rovers and wheelchairs and harnesses and hoists and lifts. They didn't have handicapped vans and placards to put where your mule gets up front when everybody else's has to. They didn't have it. And so at this point, I believe that Mephibosheth is thinking to himself, this day has changed me forever. How could it not? He had to think at some point that he was destined for destitution. Now, I don't know that he could think those words at five years old, but what do I know? I think he understood that if I can't do, if I can't play, if I, my friends are going to stop hanging around. So for him, he had to imagine the enemy had to be working overtime on him. There's no hope. You have no future. See, it was the search for safety from David that got him paralyzed. Oh, let me say that again. It was running from David, God help me right now, who meant him good that got him broken. Can I put it in today's language? People that are running from God are finding themselves broken and paralyzed and, and, and sick because they're running from a God who's chasing them for the purpose of blessing them, not killing them. Hey, you want to go to church? I ain't going to no church. I don't need no God. Don't pray for me. Running. Fearful. And God's saying, I want to bless you. Oh, no, I ain't hear nothing. I'm trying to heal you. I don't want nothing you got. And they wind up tripping and getting hurt. Because they're running from the one who's trying to save them. So David searches. And he says, is there no one of the family of Jonathan, the family of Saul, to whom I can show kindness. Now, can I tell you how backwards this is? Saul, on multiple occasions, tried to murder David. And yet, here's David saying, because of my covenant with Saul's son, is there anyone of the lineage of Saul that I can bless? Is there anyone of the family of the one that tried to kill me, murder me, exile me anybody in his line that i can show kindness how many have seen the little little videos where the child is sick and needs to have medicine but they see the little syringe you know, going to squirt some nasty juice in their mouth, and they're not having it. So they get locked jaw. <laughs> not, they're not taking it. So they go find a, a Capri Sun juice bag. Y'all see that? And they hold the juice bag so they can see it, poke the straw all the way through the bag right into the medicine. <laughs> then they look at them like, I'm not sure this is really right, but it says Capri Sun, so... <laughs> That's how I feel about the gospel. Because I'm dealing with people that are sick. And if they would just take the gospel as medicine, it would heal them. So I have to show up in their environment and be who they think that they need me to be while I'm giving them what I know they need. Y'all ain't getting this at all yet. Huh? Huh? I got clients that call me and they think that I'm coming to fix their computer, their phones, their cabling, their, their internet, their, their, their network, whatever. And while I'm there, I'm talking to them about the Lord. I'm saying, what's going on in your life? Why are you so sad? Why do you look so mad? What happened to you? Did, were, they, were they mistreating you? Do you guys know that's how I met Kimberly? Huh? 
That's how I met Kimberly. I'm sitting, I'm sitting at, a, at the computer that's next to her at the front desk. What's your name? <laughs> Do you know Jesus? Huh? Next thing you know, one of the wristbands just slipped right off my wrist and right onto hers. Huh? So we have to be who people need us to be, not necessarily what people want us to be. And while I'm on this bandwagon, let me talk to some of you parents. You need to be to your kids not what they say that you should be to them. You need to be to them what God says you should be to them. Because the kids don't know what they need. That's why they're kids and you're the parent. So be the parent and stop being led by the kid. It ought to be against the Bible for any child to not know the sound of daddy's belt coming out of the five loops. Huh? Huh? If mama's wearing Wranglers, we might have a whole other issue. I'm just saying. Lodabar is where Mephibosheth landed. We know it's east of the Jordan River. It was known for characteristics that include, but are not limited to, barrenness, wastelands, devastation it's in the midst of a wilderness it's a place that has no pasture no greenery sounds like new mexico it was desolate it's called lodabar and in lodabar mephibosheth lost his rank he's no longer the grandson of the king so he's lost his prestige his respectability his reputation. He went from living large to living in hiding. He went from being a prince to being a servant. He went from being powerful. I want that bottle. I want that toy. Go get it. And they're terrified not to do it for him. He, that's the king's grandson. But now he went from being powerful to being afraid. He's now subject to persecution and slander. And then to add insult to injury, he's now crippled and lame. Living in a forgotten country. He's the one that people laugh at, point and jeer at. So now we come to the, the point he's now about 20 years old. It's about 15 years span. Which, by the way, Mephibosheth, the meaning of that name, means he scatters shame or destroys shame. That's, that's a vast difference. You're either scattering it or destroying it. I think that's true of, of believers, don't you? So in this story, the position of David is the position of Jesus, okay? So David is now king over all of Israel, and in Philippians 2, 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming into the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So I have to imagine that David one night got tired of watching movies and playing games. And he was just sitting drinking a cup of coffee in the night air, looking at the stars, and it occurs to him stories about how he and Jonathan used to hang out, how he misses his old friend, and how he wishes that there was just somebody that was of his line that he could bless. And so David vocalizes that to those in authority. And word gets back to him that there is one named Mephibosheth. And so he sends for him. Can you imagine you're hiding from David? 
This is before Google Maps. And his chariot rolls up to your house. <laughs> you can't run. Mephibosheth here? He's sitting on the floor. What do you got? No. Yeah, it's right there. We come to collect you. Can you imagine what's running through his head? He found me. He gonna kill me. Now, guys, I remember as a kid, y'all in this room, y'all don't think y'all know anything about this, but I, I was a little prankster sometimes in church, okay? And so if I got too loud, I didn't get a warning. Well, I did get a warning. If dad ever turned around and looked at me and went, that was it. Didn't have to say a word. All I did was get the look. You know what I'm saying? But if he ever raised his hand and just snapped his fingers, that meant you're dead. You're dead. Dead. Huh? You don't even know what that is. And we used to go to church in Mustang, which at that time didn't have the nice highways. We had to take back roads. It was a 45-minute drive. So the whole way home, And it was a great relief if they decided, hey, you want, you want a hamburger? I think I want a hamburger. Yeah, yes! Yes, I want a hamburger. Take me public. <laughs> huh? But that ride all the way home was miserable. I'm going to say, in, in many cases, the ride home was more miserable than getting whooped. Because at least when I got whooped, it was done. Huh? Chariot rolls up. I don't know how long that ride was, but you get him back. He's going to kill me. How are you going to kill me? He's going to take a knife, dagger, spear, guillotine. <laughs> Put me in the lion's den and say, run. Right, what's he going to do? And so he finally makes it to David. <laughs> and David calls his name. How many's ever had your name called in a way that just made you melt? Huh? How many's ever had your name called in a way that your hair stood up on end? Huh? A lot of it has to do with tone. Right? If mom's in the kitchen and needs some help, it might be, Joel. And I, oh, yeah, mom, well, what you need? But if for whatever reason I didn't hear, it was, Joel, yes, come in. Huh? The difference. I wonder how David said Mephibosheth. Think about that. He had to get carried in, sat down. The Bible says he bowed low. I have to believe that there was compassion. David has been waiting. David is not trying to lord anything over him. David is so wanting to lavish him with, with goodness and kindness and love and, and everything. He did not get in Lodabar. So I have to believe that the tone... And the pitch was just welcoming Mephibosheth. I feel a whole lot better about that than Miffy. <laughs> huh? So he's helpless. He's terrified. But in this story, David is the example of a loving Savior. Let me say it again. God's grace, God's grace is the Father's goodwill paid for by Jesus. I want you to hear that the grace of God pursues us and will go wherever you're at. You need to hear that. God's grace will pursue you wherever you're at. And Lodabar, there was no pasture. It was barren. It was desolate. It was nasty. It probably stank. And God's grace found him there. Just ask the prodigal son. God's grace found him in a pig pen. Ask Joseph. God's grace found him in a pit that was dug by his own brothers. Ask the Samaritan woman. God's grace found her at the well in the middle of the day. Ask Gomer. And I don't mean Gomer Pyle. I'm talking about Gomer the prophet Hosea's wife. You guys know that story? God told the prophet, he said, I want you to marry Gomer. She was a prostitute. She kept leaving home to do her thing. 
He kept going knocking on doors, finding her and bringing her home until one day she was sold. And the Lord said, go get her. So he went to the auction block and he bid until he won his wife back and took her home. Sounds like you and me coming to Jesus and then running to go play and then until finally one day the devil says, ah, I got you. I'm going to say to the highest bidder and Jesus walks in and lays his blood on the line and takes us home. You hear what I'm saying? It's God's grace. So just like David, God sends out messengers of grace, and that's where you and I come in. We are FedEx for the Holy Ghost. But no matter where you're at, grace is going to find you. Grace is like a bloodhound. He will find you. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 42, And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. For as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and your seed forever. See, David was not looking for just one particular individual. He was looking for any. And any could have very easily been many. God's grace remembers us. I know there's some people in the room right now. I'm just getting this right now in, in my knower. There's people in this room that you're here trying to get God's attention, hoping that God's going to pay attention to you because you're convinced that God forgot you. God's grace has never forgotten you and never will. So whoever that's for, take that to the bank. Grace overlooks our fault. Let me tell you just how good God's grace is. The servants that took Mephibosheth and hid him. David calls them in and said, you're the servants of Saul, which means you're now the servants of his grandson. So he's going to be in the palace eating at my table, using my sheets and my indoor plumbing, and you're going to work the fields for him and bring him a percentage all the days of his life. Because I'm letting you live, you're going to keep doing your purpose and your function. Talk about a Cinderella story. David's call was a blanket, is there anyone? But it got real personal when it was Mephibosheth. God's call is whosoever will, but it gets real personal when he names your name. I don't know who's ever heard God audibly. I have not. Everything that I've heard from the Lord has been something I've I've just known on the inside. There's something powerful when your name is mentioned. And that's why sometimes I struggle because even if I was talking about the cleaning team or those that helped to set up and tear down the men's fellowship thing or, or, or helping with the youth department or th whatever, uh, there, there's always that, that nagging thing that if I don't have a list written down, I'm going to inevitably miss at least one name. And when that one name is not called, it feels like a to them. But the inverse of that is true. Even for those that say, I want no credit. I don't, don't say anything about me. Just, just leave me out of it. When their name is mentioned in a positive light, they can't help it on the inside. Just kind of. Huh? They pull a Mr. Bean. You know what I mean? Just And. It, it's meant to be that way. You can't put miracle grow on a flower that that flower just doesn't. And, and mentioning a name in a positive way does that. So you can imagine what happened to Mephi, Mephi, it's gonna come out, Mephibosheth's life when David mentioned his name. How be it all the more when God calls our name? Amen. 
do you understand that the moment that we're standing before him and roll call goes and he calls me by name, uh, I may be on the floor saying, yes, Lord, here's your servant, but on the inside I'm going, yes, yes, huh? Call my name. I hope you're on the list, but he called mine. You see what I'm saying? There's something powerful about when your name is called. If I'm being transparent, he really is calling your name right now. But sometimes we get so obstinate, it winds up being what we think is a playful game that as long as I keep denying him, he'll keep chasing me. Do that when you're dating. You know, they call you, you ignore that one. They get a little bit more intense. They may call for a couple, three days, but at some point, the call's going to stop. And somehow we have, we've, we've bought into this lie that as long as I'm sensing and feeling the presence of God and I can, I can feel him, you know, wooing me, that I'm, okay. I'm in a good spot. I'm in a good spot. He, he's around. He knows me. Yeah, but you don't know him. I have a friend of mine who, every time I put pressure on him to come to church, I know, I know, you and my whole family tell me all the time how I'm supposed to be in church, blah, blah, blah. I said, the problem is you've turned it into a game, and you're afraid you're going to be on the losing end of that game if you show up. You've got a wrong mindset about church. You catch what I'm saying? So we got people that pride themselves. Well, I've been to that church, and I went and heard that minister, and they laid hands on me there, and that one prophet prophesied. Well, they don't know, so they'll say it prophesied over me. And so, you know, none of it seems, I just feel the same. No, they just enjoy the fact that, that God notices them, knows them, and wants them, and they're afraid that if they said yes, then the pursuit would stop. They want to be pursued. Here's the crazy thing. So does God. There's some days I pursue Rachel more than she pursues me, and there's some days she pursues me more than I pursue her. But the pursuit goes both ways. You catch what I'm saying? So as, that's the way it's got to be with God. I'm, I'm constantly pursuing him, and then when my flesh gets weak and I start faltering, he pursues me. And, oh, yeah, here I come. And it, you see what I'm saying? There's, there's, it's back and forth. And that's why sometimes when you feel that nudge, hey, call so-and-so, hey, text so-and-so, hey, invite so-and-so, hey, throw them a, a, a PDF or throw them a, a picture or what, what not about an event that we're having, and you just, ah, pff, you don't understand that what God is trying to do is use you as the FedEx or the Holy Ghost to send them an invite that they're going to perceive as not from you but from him. Some of you have been dismissing doing that, saying, ah, they don't even like me. It's not about you. You're the delivery person. I don't have to like my mailman to take the mail. It's one thing for God to call your name. It's another thing for you to respond. It's one thing for him to offer salvation. It's another thing for you to accept it. Salvation has been offered. It's on the table. Mephibosheth accepted the grace that was granted to him. He didn't turn away from it and say, Pfft, you're the next regime. I want no part with you. But unfortunately, there's many people that after hearing the message of the goodness and the loving kindness of God, will still walk away. Grace is where he abandoned his crippled past. And watch this, his crippled mentality. You know how many people I've ministered to on the daily that have a crippled mentality. Grace is where he discovered who he was born to be. Grace is an intimate position. It's a perpetual position. It's a forever position. Grace is where he embraced David's favor at Jonathan's expense. How many of you ever got a gift, whether in the mail or some relative that you hadn't seen except that, you know, once every 10-year family reunion, and they give you this envelope, and in it is a pictures that you 
just cannot believe it still exists or a piece of jewelry or a, a handwritten note from a relative that's, that's deceased and you oh, oh, where'd you find this? And how you will cherish that even if your kids and grandkids and whatnot, they have no clue what it is, you'll cherish it all the days of your life. How much more should we cherish the call from God, the peace of God, the love of God? We cherish old trinket junk more than we do the living God. We cherish what's dead We celebrate people that are dead more than we celebrate the God who lives. That blows my mind. There's a lot of churches that ought to just go ahead and come out of the closet. They need to go ahead and get a golden calf and bring it up to the altar on Sunday mornings and get after it. Because what they have is dead. He said, that's mean. No, that's real. There's idol worship happening all over the place, and believers have no discernment to see it. I'm at the end. I'm tying a bow. Grace is God's reward at Christ's expense. See, this is a great salvation message, and I, I'm all about that. But I'm going to say this, too. For the believer, how many times have we fallen? We're still lame from our own falls, trying to run our own lives, trying to do our own thing and call it God, trying to fulfill our own dreams and ambitions and, and say, yeah, God, come on, bless this. I'm sure in this room I'm talking to some people that, that may be mad because you've been carried off and dropped. You got dropped by somebody who was trying to save you, was trying to do a good thing, but they wind up hurting you instead. Got dropped by somebody else's fall. That almost doesn't make sense. Let me put it like this. Remember I've said it before, I can love you and disagree with choices that you make. But if I allow my love to you to be tainted by the world system so that you feel and I feel that I have to be loyal to you while you do wrong, then that's a problem. So if you are trying so hard to be there for somebody else, but their sin is dragging them down, and you fall because you're connected to them, it's because you got connected to them instead of staying connected to him. It's like hanging off of a cliff and you got your hand in God's and you got a hold of somebody else and they're saying, this hurts, let go. You got a choice. You're going to be loyal to God and let them go or you're going to be loyal to them and you're going to let him go. That's how this works. Ah. Some of you are terrified to move farther in Jesus because you're afraid if you move farther in Jesus, you're going to move farther away from those that need him in your mind worse than you do. So what you're doing is you're staying in earshot and an eye shot of where God is at, thinking that you're safe because you can hear him and see him, even though he's getting farther and farther away. So you can stay close to the one that you feel is worse off than you. What you have misunderstood is they are thinking that you're so close to them and they, they think that you're so close to God that they're okay because they're close to you. So as soon as God goes over the hill and you can no longer hear him or see him, you're now bound to that person and you're both in Lodabar. Some of you feel like 
You've been dropped in a place that you didn't belong. Not my fault we made it in Oklahoma. Not my fault I had to grow up in this, you know, this city, this town, this blah, blah. Come on. Not my fault I had to go to that church. Now you can't walk straight because you're crippled. So every time you get up on your own feet, you fall down. Every time you try to walk, you fall down. Every time you make a vow to the Lord, you find yourself falling backwards. Every time you make a promise, you fall. Every time you try to do the right thing, Mr. Wrong kicks you over. Some of you right now find yourself content even living in Lodabar because you're saying, hey, at least I'm alive. I may be in a barren, dark, desperate, nasty, stanky place, but I'm, I'm alive. We got to get up. We have to get up. I'm talking to people that if you would just be transparent and honest with yourself, there's some in here that are crippled by despair. Some of you are crippled because of the death of a loved one. That's crippled you. You can't get on with Jesus because you're still stuck at the grave. Some of you are crippled by disease. You believe your symptoms more than you believe the healer. Some of you are crippled by things from your past. How in the world can God ever expunge my history when everybody that I know knows about it? Some of you are crippled by desires that won't turn you loose because you've not submitted yourself to actual deliverance. So there's people that are living in pain, and some of you think that at least if, if I'm in pain, at least I know that I'm alive. Do you think that's what people in hell that are in eternal damnation and death think because they feel pain they're alive? I don't think they would share your, your thoughts there. Some of you are still locked into alcoholism and defeatism. Some of you are still locked into all kinds of addictions and appetites. But I'm inviting you today to come out of Lodabar because God has sent me to drive his chariot to your town and bring you back to the castle where he's at. You hearing anything that I'm saying? Some of you feel like you're nothing. You feel like you've been walked on. You've been down so long you don't even know which way is up. But you have a choice. So grace of God is not just to get saved. The grace of God also sustains us, provides for us, mends, heals, and restores us. Can you imagine in my illustration, can you imagine how messed up it is to be saved but live in Lodabar? You're royalty, but you're living in hell. Too many people that I know and love are living in a wasteland. It's time to live in what God provided. How many would just be honest and say, you're kind of talking right at me, and I have felt at least once, maybe multiple times, that I've absolutely just been dropped, and I'm broken, and I'm lame, and I know it. And I'm not sure what to do about it. Let me just see your hand. Hold it up. Hold it high. Don't make me guess. All over the place. Here's a here's the last illustration. Kids many times don't understand value. So you take them to the dollar store. And say, you can have everything you can hold. Everything you can hold. So they walk up to the counter like this. And you say, you can have everything that you're holding. Or you can let all that go. And have $200. And they're looking at this. <sighs> And they don't understand the value of this because this seems too easy. I work to get this. That's my issue when I'm dealing with believers who are broken and they drag themselves to church 
and they know they're broken. And I'm saying you can lay down everything that you're carrying and walk out wealthy, healed, mended, and restored. But they don't see the value of what well, I've prayed, I've asked. I've had people, I've had, I've had brother so-and-so who carries a lot more anointing than you do lay hands on me. You catch what I'm saying? Where's Chris? Can I, can I pick on you with one little story that you gave me about when you got healed the other day? If you've ever sat down and talked to Chris, Frank and Jesse got nothing on him. And so for 20 years, he's lived with nightmares every night. Every night. So a week ago Sunday, he comes up, and Sean McDaniel prays for him. Something shifts in him. So a few days later, I get a phone call, and he's bawling. I say, you all right? Yes, I'm fine. What's going on? I'm just getting delivered again. <laughs> Hear me. Well, deliverance is not a one and done. But he made a statement that grabbed me. He said, Joel, you've been telling me about this since I've known you. But he said, I finally decided to take it when I went down to see Sean. It's the same stuff, but that time I took it. One more story. Years ago, we were, at, we were in, uh, in a restaurant, Nosh. And those of you that know Pastor Jim and Tina Grounds, Jim was there. Remember when he got healed in his jaw? So he had no feeling, was totally numb, dead nerve. His taste buds were cooked by radiation. He couldn't taste. And so the Lord healed him on the spot. Three days later, I called him. And he's giggling and laughing, and I hear wind noise, you know. I said, what's going on? He said, well, we're taking an impromptu vacation. Where are you going? We're going to Eureka Springs. Why are you going to Eureka Springs? He said, we're celebrating the healing that God brought in my life. He said, I've gained five pounds in the last three days because I, I can actually taste my food. Watch, watch what he said. He said, the only thing that makes me mad is that I waited nine and a half years to take my healing. Nine and a half years of no taste. Nine and a half years of no feeling your wife kiss you goodnight. Nine and a half years of not even caring what's on the menu or where we're going to eat. You could eat dog food and not care because you can't taste it. He said, the only thing that irritates me, he said, I, I let the enemy rob nine and a half years. Because the healing that I got three days ago was available to me nine and a half years ago. So that's what I'm trying to say to believers. Don't think, well, I'll just get it all when I get to glory, when it's available now. Don't live in Lodabar when God's bringing the chariot taxi, Uber donkey, right to your door. Does it make sense? Let me pray for those online, and then, and then I want to pray for you, okay? Father, for every person who's caught this stream in any part or portion, I'm asking today, God, that you minister to their hearts, their minds, their will, and their emotions. I'm asking you today to, to, to twist their spiritual arm into submission so that they will say yes to everything that you've provided because it's for their benefit and for your glory. I'm asking you to do what no person can do, what no doctor's been able to do, no psychologist, no psychiatrist, no friend, no confidant, no mate, no anything can do. I'm asking today, God, that you do it for them right now as they simply submit to you and say, yes, Lord, I'll feast at your table. And yes, Lord, I'll take everything that you're offering today. Forgive us, Lord, for leaving the deals that you bring to us on the table. In Jesus' name. If you're looking for a new church home, we're looking to grow the family. 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. Sunday afternoons at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Thursday evenings at 6.45 p.m. So until our next appointed time, God bless you. Have an incredible day.